type of uh, disease that we see. And as usual, we will discuss it from the clinical, radiological, operative, and pathological points of view. So whenever you see something like this, brain hemorrhage, it's not only hypertensive bleed or aneurysm, so many differential diagnoses go into this kind of uh, lesions. So what is differential diagnosis? And what are the diseases that can cause this? You'll be surprised how many diseases can cause this. Systemic hypertension, of course, is the famous one. Whenever we see a bleed, we say this is hypertension. And the story of a man or a woman old enough, 60, 70, with non-hypertension on treatment, arrives to the uh, ICU or the emergency room unconscious, and they do this, and they discover that his blood pressure is very high, and then this is systemic hypertension. So uh, systemic hypertension has certain features and, and uh, the criteria that you diagnose by. But most of the cases, 50% of brain hemorrhage are due to systemic hypertension. A dangerous, very common in all sorts, all kinds of countries around the world, brain contusion and hemorrhages, extradural, subdural, you name it. Ruptured aneurysm, a very famous cause of intracerebral bleed. This is a rather giant middle cerebral artery aneurysm that ruptured into the sylvian fissure here. Ruptured AVM, arterial venous malformation. Rupture of arterial venous fistula. It is something we forget about it. We think of aneurysms, AVMs. We forget all the vascular pathology of the brain. And this is one of the forgotten pathologies of the brain, arterial venous fistula. Cavernomas, rupturing causing hemorrhage. Hemorrhagic infarct. Venous infarct. In this case, it was due to damage of or closure of vein of Labe on the left side. <coughs> Sepulous sinus thrombosis causing hemorrhage is usually bilateral. Yes, and and this. Some, interfe some interference, uh, John, would... Uh, I got it, sorry. Okay, no problem. Uh, these two, the antiplatelets and anticoagulation, are forgotten issues. People forget to ask patients whether they are taking these drugs. And I tell you, my experience, I was surprised that lots of patients don't think of aspirin as antiplatelet therapy. They just take it for granted and they can have a bleed due to aspirin. So this is an essential question that I ask for any patient I want to operate upon. Are you taking aspirin or Plavix or anything of the same similar nature? Are you on warfarin or heparin or whatever? These are essential questions to ask. Antiplatelet therapy, just aspirin causing this. Anticoagulation therapy. Hematological disorders, we forget. We just lost the contact with these diseases. They don't exist anymore. They do. There are patients with deficiency of coagulation factors, factor one, seven, eight, nine, 12, bone Willebrand disease, etc., etc. This is a patient with hemophilia presenting primarily with uh, hemorrhage. Myeloid leukemia presenting with hemorrhage. The IC, disseminated intravascular coagulation. And if you go and study this DIC, you'll find that the commonest group of patients who would get disseminated intravascular coagulation are patients with brain tumors. Coagulation disorders. This could be a congenital coagulopathy or acquired coagulopathy or a neoplastic coagulopathy. Cerebral angio angiopathies, so many. Primary cerebral angiopathy. 
amyloid cerebral angiopathy, autosomal dominant leukoencephalopathy, mitochondrial encephalopathy, as if these diseases don't exist, they do. And there are patients who will present to you with, uh, with a hemorrhage like this, and you have to know what is the cause of this. Very common, angiopathy is the cerebral amyloid. And how many of us would think of amyloid? It's a disease that is there. So stop thinking of the common. You have to think of the common and the, the uncommon and the very uncommon if you want to succeed in saving patients' lives. Vasculitis of various types and names. And this, drug abuse. We think that Middle East does not have drug abuse. There is. It is in our countries. It is in Jordan. It is in the Middle East. It is in Asia. There is a drug abuse, a drug dealers, drug traffickers, users. And the commonest drug to cause bleed are cocaine, amphetamines in general, in general and the general sympathomimetic drugs like ephedrine. These are true. Uh, pictures of patients who had bleed because they were on drug abuse. <coughs> infection. Can infection present with hemorrhage? Yes, fungal infection. Look at this, blood vessel with high fee, high fee inside the blood vessel. So they rupture the blood vessel and they cause hemorrhage. Subarachnoid intracerebral hemorrhage, complication of rhinocerebral mucomarcosis. Subarachnoid and intracerebral due to mycotic aneurysm, high fee in the wall of the blood vessel, weakening it and causing rupture of aneurysm. So mycotic aneurysm. Now you are in the emergency room and you get pictured like this. Should you think of mycotic aneurysm? Yes, of course, all the uh, causes of a brain hemorrhage must run through your mind with every case you see. Even if you see it every day, you have to think of it every day with every case, with every patient you see. They have to, you have to run through these uh, causes of hemorrhage to reach to a proper diagnosis and therefore proper treatment. Now, the essence of the tonight is the hemorrhage in the tumor. It is one of the causes of uh, hemorrhage that you see on a CT or MRI. May I talk here, Dr. Ibrahim? Sorry? May I talk here? Yes, please. Go ahead. So, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm uh, Dr. Ala Adasi. I'm an oncologist and a hematologist. Um, may I just emphasize that probably the best, Im most important test to be done for these patients with this differential diagnosis is a very good uh, past and family history. You can detect disasters by and prevent disasters by taking a very close past and family history from the patient. Now, very good screening test to be asked in, uh, in, a, in a population that the majority of which is Muslim in this part of the world, is what happened for male relatives during circumcision at birth. And you can unfold a lot of problems and disasters this way. Past history, family history, and uh, operative history is of paramount. Taking very good drug history is extremely important because you'll ask the patient, are you on a blood thinner? And he would answer no. Are you taking aspirin? Oh, yes, I am. Are you an anticoagulation? And the answer is no. Are you taking a medication called Eliquis? Oh, yes, I am, etc., etc., etc. Are you on any blood thinner? No. Are you taking subcutaneous injections like an oxyparin for any other reason? Oh, yes, I am. These are very important things to be unfolded by very by taking a very good family and past and drug history. It's much more important than subjecting patients to something like bleeding time. You have to scrutinize all their medications yourself. You have to take a very good family history from them. 
and from the mother if available, because she would know what happened with circumcision with this patient and his brothers and siblings. I cannot uh, uh, um, uh, emphasize this enough because no screening test before this surgery would prepare you to prevent disasters like get, taking good family fast medication has. Having a normal PT-PTT is not a guarantee that you're not going to have problems during surgery. Having normal platelets is not a guarantee that you're not going to have problems during surgery. Bleeding time on its own is a useless test. It's very operative dependent. It's very operation dependent. And I rarely order it unless I'm looking for something in particular. Okay? And I apologize for the interruption and not for the all, quality man. of my voice, which is muffled by eight masks on my face. <laughs> no, no problem. <laughs> Thank you very much. Allah is a uh, hematologist and oncologist. And I think uh, people would benefit from the words of wisdom he just said. The history, the drug, uh, the drug the patient is taking. People are forgetting these things. They just go for the MRI or CT without history, without good physical examination. And then mistakes can easily happen. Thank you, Allah. Uh, so the one of the causes of hemorrhage is hemorrhage into a tumor. And this, surprise, surprise, 3.6 of all intracranial hemorrhages. I can tell you something more. In some some series, it's up to 10% of intracranial hemorrhages are caused by hemorrhage into a brain tumor. So this is a common thing. This is a common cause. And this is the seriousness of it. Intracranial hemorrhage could be the first sign of a previously unsuspected, undiagnosed brain tumor. And what's the seriousness of the matter? This bleed may mimic cerebrovascular accident, say hypertensive bleed, whatever, and thus affect diagnostic workup, treatment, and outcome. And I will show you this in my personal series. And when hemorrhage occurs in the tumor, it is not inside the tumor only, which is 85% of the, of, the, of the cases. It can be just subarachnoid hemorrhage, subdural hemorrhage, intraventricular hemorrhage. Again, how many of us, when you see a subdural hematoma, think that this may be caused by a tumor, that this may be caused by AV fistula, this may be caused by rupture aneurysm. And when you look at these uh, tumors, why do they bleed? There are certain features. There is tumor necrosis inside, visible wall degeneration and weakness, the tumor has infiltrated into the blood vessel wall. Thromboses of blood vessels are ruptured and again ruptured vessels. Example of hemorrhage into a tumor. Infarction into a tumor. Thrombose vessels. Again, when I speak, when we speak about hemorrhage into a tumor, it's not only hemorrhage, it could be infarction. Like we see in the pituitary apoplexy. Evidence, taught was feeding visits may rupture easily with these tumors and they can cause hemorrhage. So let's concentrate into hemorrhage into a tumor. It's not only hemorrhage, it could be necrosis infarction, it could be hemorrhagic infarction, it could be pure hemorrhage. Remember this, and the, the best example is the pituitary apoplexy. So I put it first. So this is a pituitary with apoplexy, and you see here infarcted areas, and here you see bleeding areas. So apoplexy does not mean just hemorrhage, it can mean thrombosis, it can mean infarction. Like the same thing we see with other tumors. Examples of pituitary apoplexy in my series, like this, you can see the hemorrhage inside, you can have it in microadenoma, you can have it in macroadenoma. So you can see, like in here, and in here, this giant uh, macroadenoma with this hemorrhage. These are uh, cases of, in my series, of pituitary. And this is in far, uh, pituitary apoplexy, a giant one. So 
what are the brain tumors that are known to have this high incidence of hemorrhage? The highest incidence is in the malignant tumors more than the benign tumors. And in the malignant tumors, the grades of astrocytoma, grade two, three, and the glioblastoma, multiforme, et cetera, and in metastasis. So the ones that are put in red are the ones uh, that are common, glioblastoma, astrocytoma, oligodendroglioma, and in the benign group, particularly adenoma, schwannoma, cavernous hemangioma. But it can occur, and I stress, it can occur in any brain tumor. And if we take the metastasis, it's common in certain types like papillary tumor of the thyroid, hepatocellular carcinoma, renal cell carcinoma, malignant melanoma, choriocarcinoma, bronchogenic carcinoma, breast carcinoma. Cases in my series, astrocytoma grade three presenting as hemorrhage. Bleomorphic exanthal astrocytoma presenting with hemorrhage. Glioblastoma multiforme presenting as hemorrhage without patient knowing, without him being diagnosed or suspected to have a brain tumor. Oligodendroglioma, they are common. They are, they, they, they are the ones that we should think of uh, in having a hemorrhage inside them. Ependymoma is not an exception. Medalloblastoma, whether you are dealing with the medial type or the lateral type, the, the five histological types, you may get hemorrhage into tumor. As a first presentation, central neurocytoma presenting as hemorrhage. Choroid plexus carcinoma. Of course, we have choroid plexus papilloma, the atypical type, and the choroid plexus carcinoma. The three of them, choroid plexus, benign uh, papilloma, the intermediate uh, atypical type, and the choroid plexus carcinoma can present with bleed. Ganglioglioma, true case, presenting as hemorrhage. DNIT, presenting as hemorrhage. Teratoid rhabdoid, common in children, and they can present with hemorrhage. CNS lymphoma, primary CNS lymphoma, or secondary CNS lymphoma, for that matter, they can present with bleed. Meningioma, benign tumor. Of course, we have the grade one, grade two, grade three, but uh, we don't think of them as presenting with, with hemorrhage. They can, and I will prove this to you. And this is one case of hemorrhage into meningioma and the histological presentation. Looking into literature, meningioma manifesting itself as intracerebral hemorrhage, the first manifestation. Patient never had any diagnosis, never been suspected to have brain tumor, but then he had some signs and symptoms and CT MRI showing hemorrhage. That was hemorrhage into meningioma as a first presentation. So why do, why do we have hemorrhage into meningiomas? How do they bleed? What is the hypothesis behind that? Uh, they are hypothesis. May I have a very quick editorial comment, uh, Professor Smith? Please do. Now, to emphasize the importance of considering underlying pathology whenever a patient presents with a brain hemorrhage. Now, brain metastases are more prone to, uh, hem to hemorrhage than primary uh, brain disease. And the most commonly seen would be lung meds and breast uh, 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 cancer. Lung cancer, breast cancer, just because these are the thing, two most common cancers in the world and most prone for CNS metastases. But any brain tumor, primary or secondary, can bleed, including rare entities, as you have alluded to from your own series, like primary sinus lymphoma that can present as brain bleed. The message we have to emphasize again and again, when you get a patient with a primary hemorrhage in the brain as a hemorrhagic stroke, make sure that you have examined the patient well to make sure he does not have a clear primary, like a breast cancer. And when you intervene surgically, make sure you have enough tissue 
to look for an underlying malignancy, be it primary or second. I cannot <laughs> emphasize this enough. Thank okay. you, Allah. Thank, Thank you, you very much indeed. Uh, we'll proceed and stay with us, please. So meningiomas as tumors that can present as a bleed. As I said, the hypothesis here is that they are vascular tumors. There are some abnormal visits inside them may rupture. The tumor may get necrosis. The neovasculature as it grows over years uh, are thin-walled. The feeding arteries are tortuous. Rupture of stretch bridging veins if you have a parasitical meningioma. And if you have a concomitant disease, so if a patient may have a meningioma, he is not diagnosed, and then he would get seizure and the seizure would cause a bleed and the patient would present for the first time as a bleed. So hemorrhage into meningioma may be spontaneous without any incident, without any history that goes with, or if you do embolization, or after doing stereotactic radiosurgery or post-operative. People say that location of meningioma is unrelated to the risk of the bleeding. Some people say no, convexity are more at risk than the skull base. My experience is that there is no relation with the location of meningioma. You can have hemorrhage intercortical meningioma as well as a skull base meningioma. And geometrous meningioma, more risk? The answer in my, in my series, no. It can happen in any type of the 15 types of histological types of meningiomas. Is malignant meningioma more at risk? The answer is no. They are all at risk. Grade one, grade two, and grade three. And the bleeding here in the meningioma could be inside the tumor, intramural, or outside the tumor, subdural, subarachnoid, or intraparenchyma. Remember that cranial meningiomas, if they have a bleed, it's much more than the spinal meningiomas. And this is a case of benign meningioma presenting with subdural hemorrhage. Look at the initial CT. This is subdural hematoma. How many of us think of underlying cause for this? We just go for bare hole evacuation without thinking any further than the surface. So this is the tumor. And this is the subdural, uh, and I will allude to this later on. Meningioma with hemorrhagic onset, parasagittal. Lateral ventricle, lateral ventricle is known to have uh, meningiomas, uh, usually on the left side here in this case, it's on the right side, but it's okay. And they can present with hemorrhage. Undiagnosed, unsuspected brain tumor presenting to you with hemorrhage. This is the message. Hemangiopericytoma, like meningioma, they are vascular tumors. Previously, they were called solitary fibrous tumor. So solitary fibrous tumor is the same like hemangiopericytoma. And this entity can bleed and present like a bleed. Papers, solitary fibrous tumor, hemangioplastoma, presenting with intracerebral hemorrhage. Hemangiopericytoma presenting with acute and neural hemorrhage. So this is serious. This is real. This is not luxury of information. This is essential information. Again, hemangiopericytoma, solitary fibrous tumor presenting as hemorrhage. So you might think easily that this is hypertensive bleed. Simply why? Because you have a very limited pathologies on, on one's mind to think further. Uh, intracerebral hemorrhage is hypertensive lead aneurysm or AVM period. It's not the only three causes. It is 300 causes. Germinoma presenting like a bleed, subracellular bleed. Chordoma presenting like a bleed. Chondrosarcoma presenting like a bleed. Pineal locus tumor presenting like a bleed with acute hydrocephalus. Vestibular schwannoma, vestibular schwannoma, yes, it can present to the bleed like this. As you said, and as Allah alluded to, metastatic tumors are much commoner to have a bleed than the primary, other primary tumors, uh, uh, as we said before. And as I said, the thyroid, hepatocellular, renal, 
melanoma, choriocarcinoma, bronchogenic breast. And hence, what Allah was alluding to, examination. It is not enough. People are forgetting to have good history and physical examination because we have ready CT, MRI. People look at it and they go for action. This is wrong. We have to go to the basics. We have to go to think about differential diagnosis, about history taking, about physical examination. This is a bleed from a thyroid. And I tell you, I've seen these cases, thyroid and colon carcinoma. When you operate upon them, they bleed like hell. They bleed and bleed and nonstop. They are really frightening. Melanoma is the same also. Again, Allah mentioned that how many of us look into between the fingers, underneath the, the fingernails, toes, to look for a melanoma, which nobody thought about it. Choriocarcinoma, very serious. In females of childbearing age, metastatic choriocarcinoma should be considered in the differential diagnosis of any intracerebral hemorrhage. This is serious. Choriocarcinoma in females especially child-bearing age. Colon metastasis, they bleed again like hell. I'll take you now through my personal cases, my personal experience with this hemorrhage into tumor. Uh, case number one, a 44-year-old female patient, Jordanian. She had visual disturbance of two months duration. She had the glasses, she had this, she had that. She had headaches, she came to us and you can see there is a supracellular hemorrhage. What is that? Is this an aneurysm? Hemorrhage, hemorrhage, hemorrhage. There. And the hemorrhage seems to be in the optic chiasm. Angiography. No, there's no aneurysm there. No vascular pathology to see. <coughs> visual examination, poor vision, especially on the left side with bitemporal hemianopia. This is the optic OCT and the visual feeds, very poor visual feeds and some atrophy of her uh, fibers of the optic nerve. Now we'll go for the surgery. Uh, I made this summary of this uh, uh, video so that it's quick. Uh, this is the optic chiasm. And inside the optic chiasm, there was this lesion, very vascular lesion. I'm trying to separate it and take it out from inside of the optic chiasm. We are separating this legion from the inside of the optic chasm. And what was the histology? Histology from Dr. Sam Fasa, a consultant pathologist and cytopathologist, American boarded, chiasmatic tumor cover normal. So it's not a simple word of aneurysm and ABMs. And I just really hate when I see reports of MRI and CT, no aneurysm, no ABMs, as if the whole vascular pathology of the brain is either aneurysm or ABM. People, the, the vascular pathology of the brain is so varied, is so wide, is so extreme that you have to expand this knowledge and the differential diagnosis. So this was a covered noma of the optic chiasm, and here are the slides to support it. I wonder if uh, Dr. Abu Farsakh is around to make his comments. Are you around? 
this is the immune staining that Dr. Farsakh uh, uh, does for us uh, in each of the cases to make sure that we have the correct diagnosis. So if you are there, Hassan, please come forward. Uh, Post-operative, you can see that we have removed the lesion. And this is long follow-up of this patient. She did very well. Her follow-up. Most importantly, that her vision improved, and not only subjectively, but also objectively, and uh, we uh, demonstrated that. For this, we sent this case for publication, and it was published in the Interdisciplinary Neurosurgery uh, 2020, Anterior Interhemispheric Approach for Microsurgical Resection of an Optic Chaos, Camerovernoma, Abraham Sway, and some of Farsakh and others. And here's the paper, if you want to look at it. Uh, as I said, um, her vision remarkably improved. Case number two, a 19 year old male Jordanian patient, sudden severe headache and vomiting, several hours duration, diagnosed as gastroenteritis. It was not gastroenteritis, it was hemorrhage into the brain, hemorrhage into a lesion in the brain. That's the lesion and the hemorrhage inside it. The MRA, MRV did not show any underlying vascular pathology. I was not happy with the MRA, MRV, so I went for conventional angiogram. And indeed, there is a tumor blush here. You can see tumor blush. Of course, when you do angiogram, we do six laser angiogram two external carotids, two internal carotids, two vertebrates. Now let's see the surgery. Uh, this, uh, we, we, we record our cases in 3D uh, for the sake uh, of uh, teaching, but here I'll uh, change it into 2D because not all the uh, people have the uh, appropriate glasses. So this is the approach, opening the dura, and you can see the hemorrhage. And this is the hemorrhage and the region. Very fresh bleed. This is, as you know, in the left temporal area. And you can see the region, very vascular bleeding uh, region. This is the floor of the middle fossa, temporal fossa. And this is the hemostasis and occlusion. So, what was the histology? From Dr. Abu Farsakh, again, atypical meningioma, grade two, with the brain in Beijing and predominance of a small cell component. So, grade two meningioma has bled, and it was the first time the patient or his family knew of him having any brain tumor. Look at this, hemorrhage, big spaces inside the tumor. Again, the immune staining that goes with it. Hello. Hello, yes. Anybody wants to make any comments? Yes, sir, go ahead. I guess not. It's all right. And this is the patient, immediate post-operative young man and uh, he did very well. Case number three, 77 year old male Jordina patient with sudden headaches and visual disturbance. 77 year old male patient. Meningioma here, meningioma there, meningioma here, there and there, and this large lesion. So you would suppose that this is multiple meningiomas, so this is meningiomatosis. 
CT showing this. But then there is this subdural hematoma here. You can see it here. Very good demonstration of the lesion and the subdural hematoma. Again, MRA, MRV did not show any underlying vascular pathology, so we went for surgery. And uh, the tumor was invading the, the bone, so we drilled the bone. Let's look at this tumor with hemorrhage into it, extensive hemorrhage. This is the midline here. This is the parasitic area. So we're evacuating the hematoma from the subdural space. And you can see why. Because one of the bridging veins has ruptured and caused this subdural uh, hematoma. And this is the, uh, the end of it. Drilling the bone. Histopathology from the top first meningothelial meningioma, grade one. As you can see the hemorrhage between the meningioma cells. You could see the bone invasion, which we have seen on the bone flap. You can see the wide vascular spaces within the tumor. And the, as I said, the immune staining that goes with it as a routine. And this is his post up. And this is the man himself. This is the flab I used, triangular flab. And this is him after that. Case number four. 77-year-old man, Jordanian, with sudden headaches, visual disturbance, and severe left-sided weakness. And look at the MRI, you can see hemorrhage here, and you can see another lesion here. So major hemorrhage here, but there is another lesion here. So one area and another, one area and another. Coronal showing you the hemorrhage. Sagittal showing you the hemorrhage. MRA, MRV did not show any vascular pathology. We did a chest CT and abdomen and pelvis. Nothing in the abdomen, nothing in the pelvis. But the chest showed that there is a lung lesion, which was a primary lung carcinoma. So we'll go for surgery now. You can see the uh, brain being bul bulging and stained. And we did this cortical incision. Again, inside, we encountered this tumor with hemorrhage inside. We are going around it, and I must stress this point, that if you have brain tumor with hemorrhage in jet, you have to remove the tumor totally. You don't leave any piece, because that piece, if you leave, will cause another bleed within the same night or the following night of surgery. So you go around it, and you try to remove all of it completely. So my aim here is to have total accession of the lesion, leaving nothing inside. A 
then you go for M stages. And uh, Dr. Samir Amr, another uh, uh, stepathologist, uh, did the study on these slides and they gave the specimen and he diagnosed metastatic poorly differentiated carcinoma. So this is a man with metastasis. He presented with a bleed as a first presentation. I don't know whether Dr. Samir is around. Are you around, Dr. Samir? If you are, please come forward for comments. Uh, no. I have a quick comment. Dr. Samir, are you around? I am around. Please go ahead, Dr. Samir. Okay, well, uh, this tumor was uh, composed of sheets and clusters of highly malignant epithelial cells. And uh, the nuclei were quite large, lots of mitotic activity. And considering the history of lung tumor, I thought I work it up on immunohistochemical basis for uh, possibility of primary lung cancer, whether it is a poorly uh, differentiated squamous cell carcinoma or an adenocarcinoma or a neuroendocrine carcinoma. Right. So we did uh, cytokeratin 7, which is a marker for uh, uh, lung adenocarcinoma as well as uh, thyroid transcription factor one, which is also another marker for uh, lung adenocarcinoma. We did also P63, which is a marker for squamous cell carcinoma. And we did synaptophysin, which is a marker for neuroendocrine tumors. And it was strongly uniformly positive for synaptophysin. So we conclude that this is a large uh, undifferentiated or poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinoma. Right. Thank, Thank you. you, Dr. Sumi. Thank you very much indeed. Dr. Ala, do you want to make a comment? In, in this setup, uh, I think Dr. Sumi would agree that neuroendocrine markers in, a, in this setup with a brain metastasis and a brain and a lung lesion, this is small cell lung cancer until proven otherwise. Because they True. will have neuroendocrine features on, uh, on, on staining. So this is a common scenario, unfortunately, with smokers, they present with brain lesions or brain hemorrhage. You look in the lung, you'll find the lung lesion, heavy, highly associated with smoking, please quit smoking. This is um, small cell lung cancer until proven otherwise. And this is such a high incidence to the extent that all small lung cancers are subjected to prophylactic uh, cranial irradiation, even if the lung is negative, even if the brain is negative as presented. Right. Actually, this patient has been referred to radiotherapy, and I think he started the radiotherapy already. Thank you, Allah. Thank you, Dr. Samir. Most welcome, sir. And this is the patient, uh, post-operative. His left-sided weakness markedly improved. And this is his post-operative CT scan showing total removal. I insist that if you have a bleeding into a brain lesion, you have to remove the lesion completely. Never close there any bleeding inside because there is a piece there. So my motto, if the, there is a bleeding in the field, I know there is a tumor left. And I just persist that I remove the, totem, the tumor totally. Case uh, Dr. Ibrahim, if I may please. have a small yes, comment. Yeah, Dr. Musa Saleh is a general surgeon. Please, Musa. And the patient is my brother. The and the patient, patient. is my <laughs> brother. <laughs> right. uh, actually, I just want to add to the, uh, to confirm what Dr. Samir said about the uh, large cell endocrine carcinoma. It has been confirmed by re-examination of the KHCC. You know, they, when, when, when you send people to the King cancer center, they retest the specimen of the blood and everything, and they confirm the diagnosis of Duxosamir. It's a neuroinduction uh, with probably small cell minority of the tumor. Uh, yes, he's due to start his uh, radiation probably uh, Sunday, next week. He's, he's much better now, only after surgery alone. Yes, just a bit of... Uh, 
addition to your to very your, very uh, very uh, informative piece of information. Yes. Thank you, Mus. Yeah. Thank you very much yeah. indeed. Okay. Uh, case number five is a 59 year old female patient from Iraq. In her home country, she had a sudden onset of loss of consciousness with right-sided hemiplegia. And here you are. MRI shows this uh, hemorrhage into a lesion. But this, unfortunately, was diagnosed as primary intracerebral hypertensive bleed for no good reason. It has all the features that this hemorrhage into something. Yet this patient was diagnosed to have left frontal intracerebral hemorrhage with dexamethasone, this, that, and the other. Her symptoms improved so good. Her stroke is just being treated and go home without any further investigation. She came our way with severe signs and symptoms, uh, severe and continuous headaches. And again, the MRI, MRI, MRV did not show any underlying vascular pathology. I insisted in doing conventional angiogram, which shows the same, no underlying vascular pathology. And we went for a surgery. Again, here we will uh, change the 3D, which I always record my cases as a 3D. It's good for teaching. We'll turn it into 2D. Again, I'll go through that quickly. You can see here vascular tumor with hemorrhage into it. Again, I don't stop unless I don't see any trace of a tumor. Even if it is a malignant tumor, I go until I find no plane of cleavage. I'm not sure whether this is a tumor and then I stop. But in this case, I persisted in doing radical excision of the tumor because this is the motto, don't leave any piece of the tumor inside. You can see this is the anterior canal base, the frontal lobe. So we have done total radical excision and here the hemostasis and so on. What was the histology from Dr. Farsa? A glioblastoma multiforme. Again, this patient did not suspect. Her family did not know. She was not diagnosed to have a tumor. She presented with sudden loss of consciousness. And people, because they are not deep enough, they diagnosed her as hypertensive bleed. Uh, this, is, this is the message. If you then don't diagnose well, if this patient in the home, she would have died. Because, May I comment, uh, Mr. Yes, Mahir? please don't go ahead. And again, I cannot. We continue repeating the same point and hammering the same nail on a weekly basis. You cannot dismiss this as a brain hemorrhage without um, uh, ruling out an underlying fat. If you don't look for it, you don't find it. GBM is the most common primary brain tumor, excluding meningiomas, of course. And by not looking at them, you are you are condemning the patient to a miserable fate. It's a bad tumor even when well treated. But there's no reason why not to look for an underlying tumor in any patient who presents with brain hemorrhage. And I believe this is the main message of this meeting today. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, I'll go for, this is the histology. Again, hemorrhage inside the tumor cells. The usual uh, neurostaining that we do, extensive immunostaining. We don't stop. We don't leave stone un, uh, unturned. And this is the postoperative radical excision of her tumor. As you can see, she did well postoperative and she received radiotherapy for her remnants of, that we don't see uh, of the glioblastoma multiforme. Last case, case number six, very unusual and very uh, emotionally uh, upsetting for me. This is a 22-year-old female patient, 22. 
recently married, got pregnant, prime gravita, admitted for normal vaginal delivery. On induction of labor, she became unconscious with one-sided fixed dilated pupil. What's the diagnosis? Oh, this is the usual coagulation that we see with the uh, pregnant ladies. Uh, this is sad. 22-year-old patient. Of course, they continued delivery. They, uh, they delivered a baby boy, a very precious one, of course. But she was unconscious on a ventilator and her pupil became fixed dilated. That's when I was consulted and looking at this massive hemorrhage. This cannot go underneath any label of any of those uh, because there was nothing to support it. People would come forward with fancy names of, uh, I don't know, normal whatever syndrome that we, we see in, in pregnancy with no good evidence. And if somebody gave it a label, then everybody would follow that label. I refused to accept that label. For me, this is was this is was serious. This is did not um, and it was not a, uh, been approved by any test or whatever. And to me, 22 year old patient who just delivered a baby deserves to live. Extensive hemorrhage. MRA, MRB did not show any vascular, underlying vascular pathology, but to me, this is not enough. Uh, this is a young lady, I need to know. So we proceeded with six vessel angiography, two external carotids, two internal carotids, two vertebral carotids to see what is the cause of her hemorrhage. We could not see anything on the conventional angiogram. Of course, this is external carotid, this is vertebral basal, and this is the right-sided internal carotid with the capillary phase and the venous phase. And this is the left-sided where the bleeding is, left-sided uh, angiography, just showing displaced vessels, but no cause for this hemorrhage. So we went for surgery. When I took her to theater, she had a fixed dilated left pupil because people were happy with the diagnosis of uh, whatever hematological disease that people would see with pregnancy. So this is the cortical opening. And again, immediately I encountered the bleed. So I proceed taking the clots out. Each piece of this clot is very important. Now I'm encountering some blood vessels, abnormal blood vessels here. Each piece is very important. I tell you, when I was operating with this lady, I was praying heavily to God, please God be with me. I want to help this lady, especially that I knew she delivered uh, a baby boy, beautiful baby boy, and it was her first uh, delivery, first baby. Again, you can see that there are some abnormal results here. My aim is to remove it totally, not leaving anything because I don't know what's the pathology. In this blood clot, you may find an answer to why did she bleed? Again, look at these blood vessels. They are abnormal blood vessels. Abnormal blood vessels, dilated. We are here getting into uh, the anterior horn of the lateral ventricle. And these vessels are tortuous going into the anterior horn of the lateral ventricle. This is not normal uh, kind of uh, vascularity. And what's the histology? 
arteriovenous malformation. Why? Why did we not see it on the angiogram? Because many cases we have seen this. You do an angiography, you don't see it, simply because theory behind it that the AVM has ruptured and destroyed itself as it were. This is the histology from Dr. Farsakh, and he can show you these normal blood vessels that are rupturing here, they have ruptured. Abnormal dilated tortuous blood vessels or the immune staining of the blood vessel wall. And this is the post-operative CT, post-operative MRI. Patient started to recover slowly, but surely. She had dense uh, weakness. But look at this. A month later, she came and visited me in my clinic with her son. This was my request to her husband and father. She recovers, please let her come to my clinic with her son. I carried the baby as if it was mine. I looked at this girl as if it was my daughter. And uh, I tell you, There's no satisfaction in life more than this. This is her last visit. Beautiful young lady functioning back as a wife, as a mother, and as a daughter for her family. To me, this is the essence of surgery. To me, this is why we are practicing. Thank you. Okay, we're done. We're done. Dr. Ibrahim, thank you, Professor Ibrahim, for the great presentations and the um, uh, very invaluable shared experience, actually. It's a tremendous work, and um, I know it's um, kind of uh, maybe the last kiss was kind of emotional for you. We do appreciate. Um, your great effort you give for that patient. I know how it feels when you um, give a new life for your patient. Absolutely. Um, that was, yeah, I, I, we do understand. We do understand the happiness and the pleasure you get once you had such successful and yet complicated cases. And we do really appreciate from the heart, from deep inside our heart, the shared experience that we should all take lessons from. So, um, well, it's, it's, um, it's really a um, source of proud for us and for you in the first place to have such um, great work with such successful outcome. I, I can see Dr. Um, so Dr. Dr. John. Victor, do you want to make a comment? Yes, yes, uh, Professor Ibrahim. Really a nice uh, lecture. Uh, the last one was very emotive, uh, a great uh, uh, work in the uh, surgery room, but also in the office. Uh, it, it is really good to see these uh, results, the outcome, uh, and uh, the picture with the patient and his child was very, very nice. So uh, we want to invite you in uh, 20 days more. We are going to have a a lecture here in Mexico. We, uh, the first two lectures are going to be in Spanish and the last one will be your lecture, about uh, 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, uh, we would like you to, to agree with uh, this lecture, Professor Ibrahim. And pleasure, once again, uh, very, very great lecture. Thanks. Thank you. I'm more, um, I'm happy to, to, to join you. It's a pleasure and honor to be with you. So just get, uh, get me the details. Uh, I think you've got my number, so send me the details and we'll uh, discuss it. But it's my pleasure and honor. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Any questions, any comments? I'm happy to answer. Uh... Can I say something? Please, Dr. Musa. 
uh, a very emotional uh, end break. <laughs> I very much appreciate this. I very much appreciate your tears. We all live this mo these moments as surgeons, and probably this is the core issue of our life, our philosophy, our practice, our experience. Uh, what actually, we, what we get paid for is not really the, the physical effort we, we do in, in operating theaters, rather for the great burden you feel on your shoulders when you operate on these people. Uh, probably how, how, how gratifying to see the, 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 the 21 year old girl with her son, probably nothing, nothing but nothing in the world can, 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 can do you better than, than this scene. Uh, uh, very, uh, I, I so much congratulate you actually for this, you know, you know being together so long, and I, I, from myself, from my family, actually, great gratitude for what you did for our uh, old man. No, he's much better, as I said. He's, he's walking now, and probably he's due to have his uh, radiation. But uh, great thanks to you, and uh, great appreciation to your effort, not for, for this very case, but for all what you do. You are a very eminent surgeon, not only locally in Jordan, but in the Middle East, probably in the world. Uh, well, great, 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 great. Thanks again. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very, very good effort. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, can I say one word, doctor? Of course. Of course. Yeah. I also, uh, I'm a pediatrician, you know, uh, on, on behalf of all pa pediatricians and doctors, you made me cry with you. It is very emotional. I also add to what Dr. Musa have said, you know, all, all the... A pleasure that you gave us today, and I thank you again. Rahim is known for this. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, any more comments, questions? Okay, great. Dr. Sabaya, what's the talk for next week? I uh, choose to speak about falco tentorial meningioma, a very specific subtype of meningioma that originates at the junction of the folks cerebri and the tentorium cerebellar. These are very difficult, complicated cases that uh, warrants complete, utter, deep knowledge of the anatomy of that area because of the venous connections there. So I chose to discuss this and present some of my cases. Okay, excellent. Okay, before we go, Dr. Sabe, if you don't mind, I'd like to show the panel what's going on and show the internet audience. John Bennett. What's going on this week? Hey, Victor. Yes, I think uh, Dr. Maurice Dazale uh, wants to say something. Okay, go yeah. ahead. Go uh, ahead. Go ahead. If you uh, quiz without sound, microphone okay. is uh, off. Maurice, uh, please just unmute yourself and please come forward. Mm, I don't know. Well, let me just go through this. She can always turn. Sure, sure. She can always come back. Uh, you can see my screen, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. This is your presentation, Dr. Sabea. It's on yes. live on YouTube. It went to a lot of. It's live on Facebook. Uh, anyways, I'm Cherian is having a big conference on the 20th and 21st. And matter of fact, Victor is going to be speaking there, right, Victor? Yeah, Victor's giving a lecture uh, on anatomy. Uh, that's this weekend. Okay. Uh, and there's Dr. Lawton and uh, Krishna are having a, a neuro uh, anterior communicating arteries aneurysm on Thursday night at six o'clock Eastern time. Yuha has his grand rounds Friday morning, eight, Friday uh, morning, seven o'clock Eastern time, eight o'clock. And, and Dr. Sabea, we have a, a Egypt. Uh, webcast yes on the on the 26th i don't believe you're speaking at this one no no uh, no but uh yeah we look forward to everyone coming and absolutely uh, i'd like to thank you very much dr survey for all your work and all your time for, that you've been teaching thank so. you very much john and we'll see you next week and i thank all the panelists and the participants um, i think this was a very fruitful uh discussion tonight we had and I look forward to see you all next week. Thank you very much indeed. And goodbye. Okay. See you, Doc. Thank you, Professor. Thank, thank, you, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you.
Okay, very good. Thanks, Dr. Sabaya. Hey, Dr. Cavolo, how are you doing? I'm fine, thanks, Dr. Bennett and you. Good, you know Victor, right? You've met him many times. Yes, good evening to my father, Shbei. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Oh, there he is. Nice to see you. See you. Bye bye. Ah, thank you so much. Nice to see you, uh, Dr. Cavolo. Nice to see you too. I see Maurice is there. Maurice, can you want to say something? Unmute yourself, Maurice. Just unmute yourself. Yeah, yeah. If, it's, if you want to meet Dr. Sabaya, come on in and say hello. It's a maybe a chance of a career. <laughs> you never you never know where you're going to end up. Train right, Dr. Sabaya. You never know where you're going to end up training. Absolutely. Uh, Maurice is a very uh, senior uh, neurologist in Jordan and one of the best in the Middle East and one of the best in the world, to my mind. Oh, okay. So, Maurice, uh, unmute yourself and let's, uh, let's uh, let see if, let's see if we can get Maurice in here. There he is. He's trying to talk. Uh, but he's he's got to unmute himself. Uh, unmute yourself. There you go. Okay. There we go. Oh, I thought it was working. I think you have a problem with your computer, Maurice. Uh, your, your, maybe your volume. Turn your volume up because it's your sound system's hooked up. I can see it. But it's not getting any volume. So your, your, your sound is not working at all. No, we cannot hear you, Maurice. It's, it's something yeah, wrong. Yeah, yeah, something wrong with your, your sound system. <laughs> okay. You have to check that. Thank you, Maurice. Okay. Maurice was the neurologist taking care of the young lady we show last, um, and uh, he really uh, took good care of her until she recovered and went home. So thank you, oh. Maurice, for that. Oh, okay. Is it from Jordan? From yeah, Jordan? Maurice is from Jordan. Yes, oh, okay. he's a very senior very neurologist, and he's passing his time between Jordan and England. He's teaching England. In, okay. in England. Yes. So he's, oh, okay. he's very, very eminent in the world. I wish you could hear you, Maurice. <laughs> We need That's to hear okay. you. <laughs> the next time. Next time. Next time. Okay, so I'll say goodbye and see you next week. Thanks. We're going to hang around here. How are you doing, Radab? Hello, Dr. John. I'm fine. Thank you. That was you? very you? harsh and by the professor. I know. You feel depressed because we're not having Kahoot? Uh, yeah, I was some kind you of... Be, are you going to be able to sleep tonight? <laughs> no, at all. <laughs> You'll have a fitful sleep. Yeah, indeed. Hey, um, Radab, Radab, yeah. you got to see this platform. It's called social.com. Let me, I'm going to type in the chat. It is so, it's potentially very interactive. And I hope you join. And, and it's, it's, I started a group for artificial intelligence and neurosurgery to interact the communities at this um, site, go to the site and go to the neurosurgery. And anyone's welcome to do that. Victor, you, you got to see this website. Man, it's a great. It's, it has a bulletin board. It has a live chat. So that like, just imagine what's up with the chat, a live chat. So you can be chatting with someone say, hey, let's jump on the video. Boom. You, you can jump right in. It's great. It's great. Okay. So you got something to look forward to, Radam. Okay, we'll do that soon. Something Thank to you. offset the depression of the uh, <laughs> Kahoot. So, hey, it's plus minus, you know? Yeah, yeah, indeed. Actually, there's a lot of depressing points going on these days. Um. <laughs> Let's not talk about that. <laughs> this, uh, is, this, is not a, this is not a drama. Exactly, right. We have to be strong. So you can work hard. Sorry. Hey, I'll take you guys on a tour right now if you don't mind. You have a second, Radam? Yeah, yeah, sure, doctor. Um, yeah, let me show you around this site, and everyone that's listening uh, is welcome to join. Where I'm going to take Radam. Yeah, doctor. If you noticed, uh, I was happy actually because the number of the participants today was doubled. Um, there was almost 60 participants, which is, um, I think it's... Um, and, and you know, you know, Radab, was I, was not, I was not able to publicize it very much, promote it, because I was busy with other stuff. We got Lawton tomorrow night. We got a couple more. And 
I didn't promote as much as I usually do. If I did, we would have got even more. John Bennett. Yes. I, I think I think kamikazes uh, uh, could help us to increase the number of uh, participants. The kamikazes. Comment, yeah, that definitely definitely an effect vector. Definitely, definitely. Uh, and, and you know what we're doing too? We're building up email addresses. Like for example, after this talk, I'll get the email addresses and put them in the mail the mail program. So that we're reaching people that like Zoom, that know Zoom, and that are used to using it, and not just people that you're blasting news to. Do you know what I mean, Victor? They, yes, they, yes, yeah, a, a loyal yes. audience, I think. Okay. Yeah, a loyal yeah. audience. Like all the people here today are going to get emails yes. talking about future ones because the people that are here know it they know the benefit i hope they know the benefits i hope they like it i think they probably do uh, and they'll get emails about other things like if you're giving a talk or if dab's giving a talk or dr gabulo's giving a talk they receive that email like you do probably victor right you get emails right hello doctor do you, do you get emails victor hello doctor yeah. hello doctor victor yeah. Oops, my sorry, pleasure thank you um, yeah. I should have, we, um, um, yes, Dr. Victor, go ahead. Uh, we had uh, several uh, brain surgeons from Mexico in the chat. Oh, are they here? Yes, yes. Oh, from, okay, uh, Tampico, from, Dr. Montoya. From Tampico, Dr. Montoya, and uh, Dr. Noe Diaz from Oaxaca. Oh, and I think there, there was uh, any, any, any more. I'd like to meet them. Come on out. Venga. Venga para introducerte, para hablar. Dr. Montoya. We'll teach Radab some Spanish. Uh, yeah, that'd be my pleasure. I always like to learn Spanish. It's very nice. I tell you, French sounds uh, great, man. Me. When I listen to people speak French, oof. It's, <laughs> it's beautiful it's language. So elegant, it's a beautiful language. Spanish. You, you like Spanish? The, and, the yeah, indeed. It? I tell you, when you have a person uh, that really I think Spanish... with people that speak Sorry? good Spanish, wow, Castellano. Have you heard someone speak Castellano? It's good Spanish, really good Spanish. Maybe Dr. O'Leary does. I think it's the second main main language in in the U.S., right? Uh, because my friends, the American friends, some of them would be speaking Spanish but influently. Um, well, yes, you, Dr. John, it's the second main language in, in, in America. Well, you know, in, not all of America. It's it's very it's probably like Jordan. Some areas have a lot of Spanish. Some have a lot of Italian. Uh, Florida has a lot of Spanish. There's more Spanish on the mm -hmm. streets than English, and you can survive in this city just speaking Spanish, but you can't just speaking English. If you go to the hotels, <laughs> if you go to the hotels, the airport. Everybody's speaking Spanish. Everybody. Wow. And, and sometimes you go to hotels, no one speaks English. So it's, it's I, don't know, I don't know if Jordan's like that, but uh, like Los Angeles, very Spanish. Chicago, very spent. New York has all language. But uh, some areas like Miami, pure, almost pure English or Spanish. John, John so, el doctor Montoya está con nosotros. Dr. Montoya, venga. Quiero, quiero, quiero el encontrarte. El micrófono. Only the video. Oh, the next time, okay. the next section. Buenos dias. Buenos dias. The next estoy, section. Estoy Dr. John Bennett de uh, este canal y yo estoy un teco de Universidad Autónoma de Guadalajara. Yeah. Dos años allá. ¿Tú, tú estás de dónde? Tampico. Tampico, ok. Nunca he visto. En la costa oeste. Golfo. Golfo de México. Sí. Uh, es famoso en la historia de México, ¿verdad? No, no sí. ha tenido un funeral para la pierna 
de Santana allá, o algo así. ¿Recuerdas esto? Sí, es un cuento real, ¿verdad, Victor? Sí, sí. ¿Un funeral para la, la pierna de uh, Santana? Sí. <laughs> en el Álamo, Álamo, Texas. Uh, qué bueno, qué bueno. Sí, uh, sí, Victor and, and, Redab, uh, and uh, Ricardo, try, try este programa, try this program. Wow. Victor, we're gonna we're gonna be able to build communities easier, Radab. Hey, what are you guys doing now, Radab? You busy now? No, I'm trying to uh, to contact this social doctor social. So I have yeah, to sign let's, in let's, for yeah. the new. Uh... When when can you go in? Because I like to kind of kind of kind of so, operate it. Yeah, I'm I'm in the website now. I'm trying. Oh, okay, to just... okay. Let me go in because I want to start a video chat. And anybody else, come on in to to uh, to social uh, doc. What is it? Social <laughs> doc dot social. Doctor so Cabulo, all you guys come in there because I want to show you this platform. And what I'll do with that, I'll go in and and send you an invite. Did you join? You got to join there. Um, not become yet, a member. I... Yeah. Okay. Become a member. Become a. Okay. It, it just takes a second, and everyone else is welcome too. Uh, Victor, to uh, okay. The social. Okay, John. See ya then. Okay. We'll.